from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for coming and spending a bit of your evening with us tonight. I'm delighted to be here on stage with these two incredible historians and biographers and all-around great people. I'm Melissa Block with National Public Radio, NPR, Annette Gordon-Reed, and Peter Onuf, as you know, the authors of the new book, Most Blessed of the Patriarchs, and we're going to talk about Thomas Jefferson okay. and other things. So welcome to all of you, and uh, again, thanks for, for being with us on this beautiful night, I should say. You're indoors on a gorgeous, gorgeous Washington night. Yeah. Um, I want to start with the title of the book, The Most Blessed of the Patriarchs which uh, you talk about in the preface of the book, coming from a letter that Thomas Jefferson writes in 1793. So he's back from Paris, he's back home. He's not quite back home, but he's planning on going back to Monticello in Virginia. He's writing a letter to Angelica Schuyler Church, which for those of us who have been steeped in the Hamilton soundtrack cannot hear the name without thinking Angelica, <laughs> Eliza. So and he's Peggy. writing to, and Peggy, <laughs> and Peggy. Um, he's writing to Angelica Schuyler Church in London, uh, talking about his plans to go back to Monticello. And part of the letter reads as follows. I have my house to build, my fields to form, and to watch for the happiness of those who labor for mine. I have one daughter married to a man of science, sense, virtue, and competence in whom indeed I have nothing more to wish, they live with me. If the other shall be as fortunate in due process of time, I shall imagine myself as blessed as the most blessed of the patriarchs. So Annette Gordon-Reed, why don't you talk a little bit about what it was in that seemingly innocuous paragraph in a letter to Angela, you're, you're taking on bridge and, and innocuous, but what was it about that, that language that intrigued you and made you think that was the, the root of this book? Well, first I want to say that the title was somewhat controversial. We had to fight to have quotes because this is a Jefferson quote about himself and we didn't want people to think that we were calling him the most blessed of the blessed of the patriarchs because I thought, you no, know. because I'm the most blessed of the patriarchs. Yes. <laughs> no, Peter might be able to get away with that, but of course I could not get away with calling Jefferson the most blessed of the blessed of the patriarchs. But um, we thought it was intriguing because it is so different from the idea of being a, you know, the apostle of liberty, mm. a Republican, mm -hmm. a person who saw himself as um, an avatar of the Enlightenment, uh, calling himself something that he calls to mind an ancient patriarch. It's a biblical, it's, it's ancient times. And he, in another letter, refers to himself as living at Monticello like an antediluvian patriarch. So. Before He's the, the harbinger of the new, uh -huh. but at the same time, he is seeing himself as this figure, a patriarch. So we, want, we thought we would try to unpack that, as they say and historians say, because we've sort of come to a point where there's a set picture of Jefferson, and a lot of what people are doing and writing about him is writing about what they wish he had done, or that they're mad that he didn't do. And we wanted to try to figure out what did he think he was doing, which is sort of an important thing, uh, we think, to try to uncover. You're, you're trying really to get inside his, his, yeah. inside his head as much and as we you can. We want to draw attention yeah. to what seems to be a paradox, uh, because the past, as is well known, is a foreign country. And our idea is that Jefferson's studies have been distorted by the need to make him speak to us now. And uh, we're not going to be able to draw anything from Jefferson until we can put him in his place. And that was our goal. How do you think he interpreted that patriarchy that he's talking about? What, what is he talking about there? What well, does it, it symbolize for him? What does he, was, it mean? he wasn't embarrassed to use the term. And no. I think that's something that we need to explore. And that was the point of this. How could he say this? And what does it signify? And the point of departure for us is that the world he created for himself at Monticello is foundational to his career in American history. His public life is not disconnected from his private life. If you want to understand Jefferson, you have to put those two things together. Yeah. And seeing himself as a patriarch is sort of accepting his position in the world. Uh, this is a person who's born at the top of the hierarchy in Virginia. He's, you know, he's white, he's male, he's the first son, he's tall, 
He's intelligent, he's well-educated, and he sees himself as, a, as having a special role. Sort of an interesting thing to think of somebody who's sort of in the middle of nowhere who decides that he is going to be a mover and shaker in the world, that he is going to sort of make his mark, and he's actually able to do that through the force of a personality that is very pretty much yeah. very self-assured, uh, confident, you might say arrogant in a way, but certainly believing that he had a special place. And patriarch to us is, it's a, it's a negative thing um, for, for most people maybe. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a problematic concept, but it was not problematic to him at all because he's thinking, I'm doing this the right way. And that's the thing that sort of yeah. grates, I think, a lot. Of and people it's important today. to keep in mind that Jefferson's whole career is dedicated to eradicating aristocracy, and that, that's a challenge for us. We say aristocracy, monarchy, patriarchy, these are all dirty words mm. for us. That's the old regime. Jefferson saw himself inaugurating a new regime. He didn't reject, however, this fundamental notion of the centrality of the family and the household to the future of the Republic. And that's what he's celebrating, is the role he's playing in his household. So does that notion of patriarchy, do you think, extend beyond the household, beyond Monticello, his family, his enslaved uh, workers, to how he approached the presidency, to politics? Did he mm -hmm. see his role I didn't think that? of himself as a no, patriarch. That was, that was Washington. The that, <laughs> Washington. No, he, he may have Wrong thought he musical. was really the father of the country. Jefferson may have thought he was the real father of the country, but uh, I don't think he, he did not see himself as a patriarch of the people, of, of Americans. I mean, the people were supposed to be the rulers, but I think his understanding of family and how people mm -hmm. should relate to mm -hmm. one another um, was central, that came from his, his conception of what family was like at, at, at Mon what he conceived family was supposed to be like at Monticello. Yeah. Well, do you remember when the nuclear family was modal? That is, most Americans lived in nuclear families. Uh, some of you probably still do, a few of you at least. <laughs> uh, but Jefferson thought it was natural, and that's a key word for him is nature. Uh, the family comes together naturally, and he imagines the republic is the most natural form of government. It's self-government. It's true to the nature of human beings. Therefore, the United States will be a kind of model to the world. Let's talk about the structure of the book a little bit, because you, you approach it in a really interesting way. I mean, you're not, you're moving chronologically, but you're not focused on his political life or the, the minutiae of his time as president. You have chapters on music and mm -hmm. on privacy and how vital privacy mm -hmm. was to him. Why don't you talk a little bit about how you came to that approach and why you approached it that way? Well, we wanted to do something different. We wanted to try to show what we thought, the things that we thought were important to shaping Jefferson's life. And We've done, you know, he was born in Chadwell, and then one thing happened, then the other thing happened, another thing happened. The idea was to have themes, things that were important to him, the things that are, we think are sort of key to his personality. We start out with patriarchy and sort of unpack that and think about what made, how he became a patriarch. The second section is Traveler, and it talks about the influence of France, what happened to him when he leaves uh, uh, Monticello and Shadwell and goes out into the world. And the last one is called Enthusiast, and that's where we, we talk about music and visitors and things that are not th the sort of influences that, that shaped him but would not be in a typical kind of biography uh, thought in that particular way. It was the idea is to sort of get inside of his head in a fashion and not just do sort of a laundry list of, of details. And if we successfully integrate his private life into his public life, then we can show how the performances that he orchestrates in his house then uh, appeal to him. And in a way, it's a microcosm of how he imagines the world should be. Civil conversation, music in which everybody knows her part and they harmonize. There's a political meaning to all this. It's, I think it's profoundly a basis, a basic to his political philosophy. The idea about Jefferson is you can never know who he is. And we think that's stupid, it's <laughs> foolish. Mm -hmm. He's supposed to be impenetrable. Mm -hmm. He's been called a sphinx. Mm -hmm. Well, Jefferson himself made a big deal about his privacy. You mentioned that, Melissa. And that privacy is 
foundational to how he understands his public life. Take this simple idea. In a republic, citizens are equal. They have to consent to the laws that the majority decides on. And that in consent has to be truly voluntary. It has to come from a, the self-determination of the individual. So how do you protect individuals from insidious influences? How, how do you take, for instance, the common person out of the mob? How do you avoid the, uh, the usual problems or pathologies of democracy? Because democracy was a dirty word in this period. Put a bunch of people together and they're gonna get drunk. And if they had a government and they controlled the government, what would you do? Well, you would pass an agrarian law. That means you'd redistribute property. So how, how do you lift people up? That's his big challenge. And crucial to the project of lifting people up to Republican government is a new conception of the consenting self. And Jefferson's project we describe as a self-fashioning project to make himself somebody. He wants to exemplify how an enlightened Republican citizen can become well-informed and can become a part of a new kind of public life based on informed consent. And he's think, he sees himself, and when I say as an avatar, he sees himself as an example of all of this. There's sort of an arrogance to this, the idea that yeah. he's sort of the national, national teacher, that he is sort of an example to people. And that's what Monticello is supposed to be. I mean, you go to Monticello if you've been there, you go into the to the Indian in Indian Hall and the the, the mm -hmm. foyer there. There's all kinds of you know, paintings and sculptors and every sculptures and everything. And the idea is that these are things he's brought back with him from France to show to people. And this is he's going to show people how to be to model this civilized behavior. Right. And so it's it's an interesting con idea to say that I am an example, you know, of something that I want other people to see. And this is what you how you model yourself. Uh, in a way to be educational to other other people. Yeah. Speaking of the consenting self, I mean, obviously, a whole category of people who were no by no Absolutely. means consenting. Absolutely. No. The, uh, what is she going to ask? The slaves. Of of ask about who has come to? But I'm curious. I mean, obviously, Annette Gordon-Reed, as you know, wrote the the seminal book, The Hemingses of Monticello. Has spent a lot of time looking into the family, the extended family of Thomas Jefferson through Sally Hemings. Um, did you come to a different understanding of how he viewed slavery? So much has been written, you've studied it so many times, um, this fatal stain as he described it. Mm -hmm. um, you, you do spend some time talking about how when he goes to France, um, his, his, you say in France slavery became fully domesticated mm -hmm. in his mind. And what, what is that? What does that mean? What it means is before he went to France, Jefferson had a reputation as being anti-slavery. The first indication of this, he's a young man in his 20s and he copies into his commonplace book uh, parts of a poem, uh, when William Shinstone, that talks about the evils of the slave trade and somebody yanked from his native land to, you know, brought across the ocean to labor for someone else. And he, um, as a young legislator, want, legislator wanted to introduce uh, legislation to for emancipation plan, which, which nowhere in Virginia, which no, no place. And he wrote about this, and he was pretty, as I said, had a reputation as being anti-slavery. Well, when he goes to France and he sees French society, in so any situation where you go, you leave your country and you think that there are bad things about your country and you go someplace else, mm -hmm. and you say, well, at least we're not like that. <laughs> you know, uh, we could at least be we French. Don't, we could be French, you know. We, you know that's, that was his attitude. He saw. He's in France during the pre-revolutionary period, and people are starving. Uh, there's unrest, bread riots, all kinds of things. And he says, you know, we have problems in America, but this place has lots of problems. And it's, they're just on the road now to being able to solve some of those problems, because he was very, very much in favor of the French Revolution. He was excited by all of that. Um, it gave him a sense that, well, we have time to solve our problems as well. The other thing that happens, he's in France with James and Sally Hemings, who are his wife's half-siblings. And he begins to treat them there in a way. He, he pays them wages. And he starts a practice that he continues when, he's in the United, when he comes back home, and that is paying whenever he's in 
a city and he's mixing enslaved labor and free labor, he pays everybody because I, I guess it causes less of a conflict. But he's living there with these people who have an opportunity to be free because every person who petitioned for freedom in France, it was granted. So it was sort of like a pro forma thing, which they could have done, James and Sally Hemings could have done, but they didn't do. Um, and while he's there, he's living with these people who become the face of slavery for him in a way. Jefferson, and he continues this when he comes home, he sees himself as um, a slave owner through his relationship with the people who were the closest to him, who were around him, but that's unrealistic because they're not the people down the mountain. Mm -hmm. They're not the bulk of, this is his wife's family, and they have a completely different relationship to him than the others do. I mean, Sally Hemings' brothers, lots of times he didn't know where they were. I mean, they hired their own time and went out and kept the money, and you know he would call them back when he needed them for something. So that's a very different relationship than he had with the vast over 700 people we think that he owned over the course of his lifetime. This is a tiny, tiny group of people who were pulled out. So he sees himself as a slave owner through that, those relationships. And I think Fran, we think France really heightened that for him. Uh, and because they don't, they do come back with him. They don't stay. And slavery becomes domesticated. He's thinking about them as members of his household and how he treats people in his household, but that's, as I said, is very, very different than the situation yeah, of other And there's folks. a kind of reciprocity then. They're, it's not symmetrical, they're not equal, but like family members, and I used the word natural before, uh, he cr has created what he thinks is a kind of family that extends, and I think, and it's using the right word when she says face, this is how he sees, wants to see slavery. But the other crucial thing to keep in mind is that Jefferson's urgency in doing something about slavery varies with the geopolitical situation. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, to put it narrowly uh, and, and neatly, in the American Revolution, enslaved people could run to British lines and join the counter-revolution. Mm -hmm. uh, later on in the uh, revolution and what becomes Haiti, the, uh, the possibility of, of uh, uprising in the hemisphere <laughs> could spread to the continent. Uh, during the uh, War of 1812, the British come again, and that's another opportunity for enslaved people to take advantage of this. At moments like this, Jefferson says, my fellow Republicans, we've got to do something about this. I know slavery is an unjust institution. We need to act and his solution, of course, is emancipation. We have to free these people. This is a radical injustice. He never backs off from that. And then we have to send them to another country. Expatriation is his, his solution. To Liberia, yeah, Sierra Leone. Well, Leon. wherever. Mm -hmm. uh, he thinks about maybe in the Trans-Mississippi, but well, after all, we might need that territory. Uh, <laughs> no, not there. <laughs> no, not uh, California. Then he thinks about San Domingue, but uh, because there, there's a, a, a black republic, it's not recognized as such, but well, maybe Africa, but that's very expensive. He goes through all these possibilities, but the important thing is that when the peace comes, the urgency goes. Mm -hmm. When the peace comes, then he sees himself, and this, I think word, this word is crucial, as a master, he's a kind of steward. He has a responsibility just as the father in the family has a responsibility. And he has a responsibility to look after the happiness of those who labor for mine, to borrow another phrase from that letter mm -hmm. that we started off with in our title. And uh, then we have a, a, a kind of domestication that Annette's talking about, and that is we're trying to create a, a sense within this household of, uh, of a good treatment of He's an ameliorator, he wants to improve things, he wants to rationalize things. There are ways, in other words, in which he can practice the enlightenment at home, mm -hmm. make things better, while we wait for his fellow Virginians to see the light, to use that trope again, and then come to the collective decision, we have to do something to end this unjust institution. Because he, he, he understands, he doesn't believe that there's what he would call a Republican solution to the problem. That is to say, white people in Virginia were not gonna vote to do away with slavery. 
that's not going to happen. I mean, during his during his lifetime, that's not going to happen. Well, the he only prayed way, that it he, would. he prayed that it would, but he knew that that was not going to happen at the time. It was going to end, and by the time he gets to the Missouri crisis, he realizes that it could end pretty much the way it ended, and that is with a war. And that is not something that he would have he would have contemplated. I mean, yeah, Haiti. I think the Haitian Jefferson and Haiti is, is fascinating because when he first hears about it. I mean, he writes a letter to his daughter. He's like, well, you know, the Negroes have you know, taken over the island, and which is going to happen in the Caribbean, and that's the natural. It, it was sort of like, oh, isn't this the age of revolution? We've got the like French. That. And then all of a sudden, he hears that lots of white people are being killed. And then the tone changes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 not, it, it's not, it's one thing for white people to kill <laughs> for their freedom in France, essentially, which he, he supported the French Revolution far longer than, yeah. than people think he should have. Uh, but for the black republic, you know, at first it's okay, but then when they start killing, then it's not okay. And, you know, well, of course, that reinforces that idea of racial national difference. And I think the, one of the key terms we play with is the very idea of race, mm -hmm. which doesn't have a fixed meaning at this period. It's equivalent to nation, people, race in the modern sense, ethnicity. And if enslaved Africans and African Americans are a distinct people, nation, race, then how could they possibly live with the people who had enslaved them. Yeah, yeah. yeah but th there, would no, there would be no peace. And that's the thing that really gives people a problem about right, Jefferson, right. because we congratulate ourselves and think that, you know, well, we're better, we're enlightened now, we're all living together in peace and harmony. Yeah, right? Mm -hmm. um, oh, come and on. No, we get along. We get along. <laughs> it's going well up here. I, I'm, I'm happy. <laughs> you're happy, you're happy. We're kind of getting along. <laughs> We're getting along, yeah. But I mean, you know, he doesn't have the confidence that it, how could blacks love a country that has treated them no, exactly. so poorly? How could, how could you do that? Because this is him saying, I know what I would think, do. And it's like he's transferring well, and basically yeah, saying and that other people that's are. That's the downside yeah. of a, a kind of sentimental conception of what a nation is. A great big family. Who love each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, Everybody loves uh, each other. How long did it take for the laws to change on interracial marriage in America? I mean, we're talking about basic stuff for mm -hmm. Jefferson. Mm -hmm. Would I want my daughters to marry black people? This is insane. And so that idea of the unnaturalness mm -hmm. of the races mixing. Yeah, but it, it, except it's interesting. We talk about this in the book that it's a very, very, it, it's, the, it's the attitude of the conqueror. Mm -hmm. White men have access to the bodies of white women, black women, Native American women, but not the other way around. And so really for Jefferson, and notes in the state of Virginia when he's talking about mixing, he's talking about the horror of the mixing of, 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 of white, yes, yeah. of white men, of, of, uh, of black men having access to white women, uh, to black women, uh, black men having access to white women. Yes. That's the problem. He doesn't have any problem with the other way around it because he knows, he knows that in slavery, slavery is a laboratory right. for that kind of thing. Well, Not, in, in so, his own household. In I his mean, own household. <laughs> In his own household, you know, his father-in-law, people in Virginia just in general. This is, it's clear that this is something that was a big part of, of, of life during that time period. And think about the implications of abolishing artificial hierarchies among white people, that is aristocracy, monarchy. All people are white people, citizens are created equal. The, you can do that, but then you draw attention to divisions that you consider natural, not artificial. To have a king, what does a king do? Thomas Paine tells us all about this in Common Sense. He's just a, descended from a French bastard. This is a, there's nothing legitimate, a, f a very important word in regimes. There's nothing legitimate about monarchy. So you abolish all those things, and we agree on that, and we celebrate this. This is the first great modern republic. Yet, what that then draws your attention to is, well, how is society constituted? What are the natural sorts of relations that emerge? And we'd like to think that would mean everybody who's involved in the revolution, we let the loyalists go back to Britain or the maritime provinces, they're, they're, they're going to love each other, it's going to be fine. Yeah. But there's a distinction here, a distinction that runs down through the society itself. We have two peoples living in one place. It's unnatural because it's vitally important to have this relationship to the land, to your country, 
This is what patriotism means, is love of country. And we have a people here against their will, who we own unjustly. Th this is impossible. It's they can't. They cannot, they cannot love us, and we, we, can we won't love them, and they cannot love us, and we cannot form families. How can you be equal citizens if you cannot be right. in, in the same family? Yes, we're all equal the same, but you can't be my right. daughter-in-law. Right. You right. can't be my son-in-law. You include um, a letter, part of a letter that, that Thomas Jefferson writes to John Adams towards the end of both their lives. There's this historic miracle that both John Adams and Thomas Jefferson die on the same day, on July 4th, right. uh, 50 years after the signing of the Declaration yeah. of Independence. Yeah. Um, he says, time which outlives all things will outlive this evil also. Clearly taking the long view he's about the slavery. Long view. Very, very long um, view. Who knows when exactly he's thinking but that will happen. But remember, he believes in the afterlife. That's true. He believes in the afterlife. And he so imagines he's going to see this. Looking down. But I'm curious, in, in the writings, in his letters, he, he talks of slavery on, on a grand scale as an institution, but does he ever refer to it within the context of his family? Does he talk about any of the, the paradox or the contradiction that we see now in his relation with Sally Hemings or any of the other enslaved people on the plantation in a direct way? Does he wrestle with that ever? I, no, he's not wrestling with this. Um, he's not wrestling. He's, with Sally Hemings, you know, talking about Sally Hemings or anything like that. He doesn't, as I was saying before, he sees himself as being a good master mm -hmm. to these people yeah. and is not to, you know, to, to my family. And it's not, this is not something that is keeping him up at night. Yeah. And most of the time that he's talking about slavery, it's at a request of somebody. Someone has written to him mm. and asked him about it. He's not being proactive. Going if he were from New this. England, he'd feel guilty mm -hmm. and he wouldn't sleep at night, but he's not. He's a Virginian. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's a... No offense. Um, you, uh, <laughs> sorry. No, I was going to say, though, <laughs> there's a lot of projection in Jefferson. When I least like Jefferson, when I most dislike him, is when his solution to any problem, why there is a problem, is somebody else's fault. Mm -hmm. uh, th this idea, the scenario that we sketched out of how you would have emancipation in Virginia, the white majority finally realizes it has to act because that's the basic Republican requirement. Mm -hmm. Well, whose fault is it? Um, and he says this repeatedly. I have made it clear what my position is. This is the only solution you're going to have to wake up to this. And now, as you quoted from that letter, it's going to take an age. It's not going to happen <laughs> in my lifetime. Well? But that's not his fault. Mm -hmm. See, that's, that's where we have the problem. We said, Jefferson, come on. Go to church. Get down. Uh, <laughs> apologize. I mean, feel bad. Get down. <laughs> <laughs> Get Did down I, on your is knees. That, is, that, is that idiomatic? <laughs> I have no idea what that means. But go ahead. Pray. Pray for forgiveness. Pray for you forgiveness. Pray for forgiveness. Okay. Oh, gosh. I have to say, uh, one of my shifting gears here just a little bit before this gets too controversial. Um, you, uh, you talk about uh, exploding some of the myths around Thomas Jefferson. And, and one of my favorites, I have to say, is that the notion that he goes to France as the minister to France. He arrives in 1784 in Le Havre. And is, as you describe it, promptly fleeced by porters because he really spoke very little French. Um, well, he studied French. He was he was a polymath. He knew all sorts of things, but his language skills when he got so there good. were not up to snuff. No, well, he knew how to read French. Yes. And if you, I mean, speaking a language is very, very different. I mean, difficult. I mean, it's one thing to study something and then actually go to France and having people speak in the normal. It sounds like a mile a minute, but their normal way of speaking to pull it, uh, you know, to sort of pull it all together. He read. French, French well, um, and he could understand people, but he had difficulty speaking the language. His daughter, um, his daughters, and Sally Hemings and James Hemings eventually um, learned how to speak pretty well, but he was older when he goes to France. He's in his 40s, and language is not uh, easily acquired at that time period. Uh, it's my favorite story about of that time period is him going to uh, a chess club and in Paris. in Paris, and then getting beaten really easily, handily by people, and he doesn't go back. And <laughs> we think that's interesting because my, my husband, who played chess competitively, said the only way to get better huh. playing chess is to play with people who are better, better than you than are. You. Absolutely. Uh, and it's, I just, it's sort of an interesting yeah, yeah. thing that he did not 
he loved to play chess, but he didn't want to do it. He didn't love it enough <laughs> to go get beat repeatedly until he got better and better at it. Uh, so he's a very thin-skinned person. Yeah. I, I think the patriarch that's of the yeah. chessboard. Yeah, and he's well. very anxious, and, and it's. Uh, and you identify with that. Yeah, I, 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 <laughs> you know, I'm a, a white guy. It's hard, um, but. Uh, <laughs> When he's in France, what is most remarkable to us, I think, uh, beyond the initial culture shock and the, the need, his need to create a little Virginia at home, <laughs> Sweet so he could be comfortable, he needs a comfort zone, is the danger he feels that lurks in French society to impressionable young people. Mm -hmm. He can barely resist the temptations himself. Well, so he young people really the don't go to Paris yeah. because it's uh, they get women uh, <laughs> who are, well, who are on the, in the streets, you know, being messing in politics. And, and that's that's why he celebrates the the properly constituted Republican family, where women are have their place. They play their role, but they're not doing politics. They're not influencing. Uh, uh, society, they're, they're in their place. And he's upset with this, and it's, it has a lot to do with sexuality, with the temptations that he sees there. In one of his letters, he suggests that if you come to France at the, an impressionable age, two things will happen to you. You'll develop a taste for whores, and you'll never learn to speak your own language well, because during this crucial period, you'll be speaking another language and having too much of a good time. <laughs> and what's really important, uh, young Americans, <laughs> what's really important is that you're have, going to have to go back. And in a republic, the key art in a republic is persuasion of speaking well. Oratory is very important. So if you can't speak the language well, and if your proclivities sexually are uh, develop in this uh, abnormal pathological way, then the very foundation of the republic is going to be subverted. I want to leave time for questions. I do want to ask you one thing. As co-authors of this book, and I'm, I'm enjoying listening to your, your slight disagreements here, were there points no, really. when, when you really couldn't agree? I mean, how did you divide this oh, up? Did you go chapter by chapter? Did you have to come to consensus? <laughs> Which one? Who wins? <laughs> She's going to talk about religion now, okay? Oh, okay, religion now. Yeah, I pray you oh, do. Oh, oh, you pray you do. Oh, the, I suppose the biggest dispute between us was Jefferson's Christianity. Um, Peter is, he calls himself a lapsed Unitarian. <laughs> Redundant. And I, and I, my thing was always, how can you tell? <laughs> and I um, grew up in the United Methodist tradition, and Jefferson calling himself a Christian, I was not convinced about mm. that. And mm. I was sort of... That's I, what I always reduced to prayer at that point. Well, reduced to prayer at that point. And he convinced me that, you know, that I, I was perhaps being too judgmental in, in that that uh, idea, because you know, to sort of suggest that Jefferson did not believe in the divinity of Christ. He believed Jesus was a great moral teacher, right. and that you should live according to the precepts of, of Jesus, but not Jesus the Christ. That's why he writes the life and morals of Jesus of Nazareth instead of Jesus Christ, and where he takes out the Bible. He scissors out parts of, razors out parts of the Bible that are that he considers to be the mysticism and, and sort of uh, magical thinking. Um, but he convinced me that I, I was, had, had too narrow, I had too narrow a view of all of this. So that was an area that he persuaded me about. Uh, we had other small disputes. Uh, and sometimes you just, you know, you just let it go. Isn't the song, was it the, the, that movie with the let it go, <laughs> Frozen. let it go. Frozen or whatever, you let it go, let it go. Uh, <laughs> And, no, I'm not going to sing it. No, I'm not going to sing that. Um, but we didn't have a lot because we basically agree. Uh, the basic understanding about Jefferson is not. It's not that different. Mm -hmm. no. You know, we're not that. We well, don't argue well, yeah. about. What was that wonderful kind of about this collaboration uh, for me, and I think for both of us, was that uh, we brought complementary um, knowledge and skills together, mm -hmm. and uh, I think the fit has been wonderful. We've enjoyed working together. Uh, the only downside for me is I am now known as a biographer. <laughs> <laughs> I don't do biography. There don't are two microphones, it. by the way. If people want to make their way for any questions that you might have, um, feel free to come forward. Well, here comes some people. Yay! 
questions. And you have gotten there first, so we're going to go to this mic first. Yes. Oh, I'm so excited to be first. Uh, Annette, I loved your book, um, Headmings of Monticello. It's been a huge inspiration for me. Thank you. And uh, I'm writing a book, and I'm interested in craft, a craft question for you. How, what kinds of, what are the biggest obstacles you had in trying to put together the sources that you were using to create a narrative? Well, the biggest obstacle is actually pulling it all together and trying to find the right way to craft a narrative. I mean, to have lots of information, to know what to go in and what to go out, you know, what to leave in and what to take out, is, is, that's the biggest thing. There was a lot there, I think. I mean, we don't have a lot of direct evidence from, or any evidence from Sally Hemings herself, but you have to sort of research around the situation. Um, I didn't, it's funny, because I didn't, I didn't, const, didn't perceive it as a problem. Uh, it was fun. Mm. I mean, I think I'm a natural detective. I love to write, but I like to research, if not more, um, but certainly as much. But I would say if I were going to, to say what a problem would be, it was learning how to take the material and turn it into a narrative and to know I have a file where you have to, the, the old saying, you know, kill your darlings. Um, I, I never killed them. I, I, I just sort of, I exiled them. They're still there. <laughs> They're exiled. They're them. zombies. The, 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 the exile is called outtakes. And uh, you just take stuff and put it away and say you may be able to come back to that later You'll on. Live another day. So it really is just, just paring things down was the, bigger, was the biggest problem. Thank you for your question. Thank Over you. here. Yeah, Annette and Peter, uh, the big thing today in New York is Hamilton. And if you look at Chernow's book, I, I, I've read your book, I've read a lot of books. Uh, it's a big emphasis on the fighting that go went on between Jefferson, Hamilton, Adams, mm. and then Madison joining with Jefferson and others. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it, it's, and then, you know, he's Secretary of State and leaving, and, and I, I don't know whether it was a temporary perspective that Jefferson had uh, during the Washington administration. And Washington is from Virginia. Uh, and, and I was so surprised to see, after reading your books, how Jefferson turned out to be evil. Am I crazy? Did, or? did you just say evil? Evil. I mean, because of the, he was against the Washington's approach. How many times he, have you seen Hamilton? <laughs> <laughs> I have the uh, CD here. Yeah. Well, I'll, no, I'll, no, no. And also, uh, you know, uh, Miranda's book and, yeah, and yeah, whatever. Yeah. No, 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 no. Uh, uh, but. The, the fact is, that looking at Chernow's book, you, he, he takes a certain perspective. Could I start an answer? Go ahead. Okay, and Annette will set me right. Uh, first of all, the idea of political opposition is absolutely illegitimate. Okay. Party, faction, no good. A republic, we've been talking about love ad nauseum. It's supposed to be that people do recognize common values and commitments, yes. and they don't. And of course, love always makes, failed love always makes things worse, as Freud would tell you about love, hate, and cathect. Uh, and the second thing is, to get to, back to the real world, uh, there's no guarantee that the American Union will survive. There's no guarantee that the United States uh, should ever cut a figure in world affairs. It's. Uh, from a world historical perspective, it's the odds against it are tremendous. Mm -hmm. In other words, there is so much at stake. Yes. Uh, and of course, with the image of uh, planting a seed and, and the tree starts to grow in one direction, that could be forever. They know they're starting something, and if they start it wrong, it will fail. Right. Uh, and so everything's at stake. And now, I personally, and I did get in trouble with Annette on this, I'm, I'm a, a little hard on Jefferson when we write about politics. I don't know. Uh, I, I, I think they're, uh, I, I understand what they're both doing. They make a lot yes. of sense to me. The fiscal military state, Hamilton, yes. he's got it. Yes. Jefferson has the notion of how to create a legitimate regime that's going to yes. connect people, forge new kinds of attachments that will sustain the government. 
Uh, all that makes sense. They all made their contribution, but you can see what the stakes are and why they would be at each other's throats. And all because Washington is listening to Hamilton too much. <laughs> <laughs> we only have a few minutes left. I want to go to another question. I have two, if you'll allow it. Um, Fast. The, uh, first of all, um, when I went to Monticello, one thing that, I, that occurred to me was that um, what Jefferson was doing relied a lot on his leisure, his ability to just kind of spend time on the things he wanted to spend time on. Mm -hmm. And so clearly he relied heavily on slave ownership sure. to do sure. those things. And yet you are also saying that he saw his um, lifestyle as a model for people to live by. So in a sense, he thought that the model of the Republic had to, would have had to rely on the institution of slavery for people to continue to try to model that. So was he conscious of that? And, and how would he deal with that um, in terms of his idea of the ideal republic. And you want to take that? We're going to have to leave it at one question to try to okay. get someone else an idea. Well, I, th I think he felt that eventually, is back to this point about what would change later on, he did not think the model would not be slave owning because eventually slavery would go away and what he wanted would be to have people, family farms, yeoman farmers, that they would take over. But what he wanted people to model was his ideas about science his ideas about art, those kinds of things. I don't. He, I don't think he saw plantation life as no, a, no. as a as a as the that aspect of his life. It was the it was the the um, uh, the exalted, the more exalted things, and not just the institution that he thought was gonna was gonna leave. And one way of thinking about it is his educational system, capped by the university, is the very narrow apex of a great pyramid that begins with primary education. He doesn't think everybody's going to reach the top. So it's not, that he's not modeling in that sense. You might say that what has characterized American middle class society is its aspirational quality. Mm -hmm. Be all you can be. Mm -hmm. uh, be learned. Learn. Be enlightened. And every man can participate in enlightenment. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's the idea. So that anyone would be edified and educated and enlightened by visiting Monticello and pearls of wisdom falling from the great man. <laughs> what a magnificent thing. One more question before we have to break. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to go back to this issue of uh, writing a joint uh, historical study like this. Mm -hmm. And perhaps you could tell us a little bit about uh, how you got the idea of working together on this book, <laughs> and then sure. how you uh, coordinated different sections or different uh, aspects of the book. Sure, thank you. Okay, well, uh, Peter said he was going to retire. And, I did. And he, and he did retire, and I got the idea that he should, I didn't want him to sort of ride off into the sunset yet, and <laughs> I asked him to write a book this with me. This is so life-saving. This is so beautiful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I talk about being nearly dead, white guy, and you're going to try to keep me going for <laughs> Well, you know, it's what I could do. I did what I could. So... <laughs> That's how, we, that's how we got the idea of doing it. We'd been talking to each other since 1995, and I thought, you know, we should, we should do something together. And so instead of, ha our, author, our editor wanted us to have one voice, so it wouldn't be good for him to write a chapter and me write a chapter, it, just to do it like that and have them, somebody responsible for different sections of it. So we tried to write sections and send them to each other. We Skyped every week uh, for a period of time when we were being very, very efficient. Uh, we, t we went out on the road and we talked about this quite a bit, even before we began to write. So we wanted to try to craft as much as we possibly could. I mean, there's some things, that, some sections that are more him and more than me, but they're all, everything we all went over and approved it, changed sentences, moved things around. Uh, there are some little quirks and whatever that I could recognize are mine and some that could recognize are him, but a lot of times we don't, I don't remember don't who know. wrote what. Yeah. And they're still talking. <laughs> yes, yeah. yes. Well, you know, yeah, there's a little tension. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do we have time for one more question? Um, We're okay. over time. Oh, I'm a, thank really? you. Annette Gordon Reed, Peter Onuf, thank you so much. Most blessed of the Thank you for coming. Thank you very much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.